within a bleak and dismal swamp, hidden beneath its murky waters, lies the headquarters of the most sinister villains of all time. The Legion of Doom. Welcome to part 2 of my Downfall of One Piece video series. In this video, I'll be covering the Dres Rosa arc in the manga. As a quick reminder for those continuing this series, or maybe you just haven't seen part 1, the main theme of this video series is to provide you my thoughts and explanations on why I believe the post time skip plays a role in reshaping the once golden legacy of One Piece into something a bit more unappealing. In part 1, I provided a lot of some sloppy, unnecessarily long groundwork for my thoughts and began trying to bring those thoughts together by looking at the arcs of the time skip and breaking them down. And I'll be doing more of that breakdown here. I read a variety of feedback from part 1, positive, negative, all that, and I'd like to thank the people who left it. If I had the ability, I'd go back and make a lot of changes to part 1 with that feedback in mind. I want to get better at this over time, and hopefully that shows itself here in part 2. There will be spoilers ahead, and then some, so if that concerns you and you clicked on this video somehow not expecting spoilers, then that's on you dude. So let's get this show on the road and begin diving into Dres Rosa. Gamma gamma my insides, we alive, we alive, hit me with the counter slide, but we block the other side, oh well, double team, still ain't fucking with the guy, I'm that nigga, took that red hawk, it was nothing, bitch, you tried, all two niggas, took two hits, now you acting like you tired, caught me slipping with the gamma, niggas acting like I died, they won't be expecting shit when Dofi hit the skies, but I put it on my bounty, you won't even see my eyes. Out of all of the arcs that I've covered and will cover in the time skip, I have the most positive things to say about Dres Rosa, which wasn't always the case, but my thoughts on this arc have changed a lot over time. As of right now, I think Dres Rosa is the best arc the post time skip has to offer, and I'll explain why near the end. Dres Rosa is a long arc, it's 102 chapters long, which makes it longer or close to as long as all of the sagas in the story, which is a lot. I don't believe in criticizing anything solely on the basis of its length. All I want as a reader is good storytelling and to feel rewarded for the time I invest in reading. If there's a story worth telling, and it takes a long time to tell it, so be it. And while length in of itself isn't always an issue, it tends to be included in a list of storytelling woes. And unfortunately, looking deeper into Dres Rosa shows you, beyond a reasonable doubt, that its length is an issue. Simply put, Dres Rosa's structure and pacing is abysmal, and it has a negative effect on the things that the arc does manage to do well. If you try to calculate the time it took for the main conflict of Dres Rosa to start and then end, meaning that we aren't including the off-screen nap time post Dofi's defeat, Dres Rosa lasted at most, and I'm probably being generous, very generous maybe, probably lasted around 4-5 to five hours. Roughly 25 chapters into the arc, half of the main characters leave and then go to Zo, and they are no longer relevant to the arc's storytelling. The crew that is left behind on the island are mostly bystanders to the arc's events and aren't involved with the emotional storytelling of the arc or its characters. The Straw Hats play second fiddle to the side characters, which makes them not main characters in this arc per se. And of those Straw Hats, only two get quote-unquote fights, and only one of the group gets a side plot. So all in all, there's not really much going on with any of the Straw Hats not named Luffy. Wow, what a surprise. Which leaves even less to write about. If you recall back to the discussion and what I said regarding Punk Hazard's horrendous pacing, the same applies to Dres Rosa except worse. The amount of things within the arc that are only there to stretch its length infinitely is mind-boggling. There is an ungodly amount of running involved in the arc. In multiple scenarios, Oda spends more time showing characters running from point A to point B than showing action or story once they reach point B. There are several different character groups and perspectives Oda is shuffling between as the arc goes on, and frequently, when Oda is trying to provide updates on these groups, the updates have no new information and only serve to inform the audience that the exact same thing that you saw the last time with these characters is in fact still happening. 
Things progress slowly through portions that need to move faster, and that results in making the pacing crazy awkward and unsatisfying. You will get a string of chapters or parts of a chapter that are really entertaining and exactly what you want to see. But then right after or before, you'll get large stretches of in-canon filler. You know, it's a... <laughs> It's pretty infamous, but the run up the plateau to reach Dofi is several chapters long and the entire thing is littered with junk. It's just straight up whack. The Funk Brothers led Luffy into a well and he fell into it with Usi. Oh no, dude! Abdullah and Jeet stabbed Dofi string comb from behind. Wow. Abdullah and Jeet are just so cool. Luffy switches from Usi to ride on full rule farther up the plateau. Yeah, let's go. Zoro vs. Pika is extended 20 chapters by having Zoro run around and Pika escape from him because Pika is way out of his league, but Oda doesn't want to end the fight yet. Sick. The main characters have to fight through multiple tiers of fodder like the Nutcrackers before reaching Dofi. And it's not even cool. <laughs> Sign me up, baby. Aw, shit. The birdcage is closing. Are the civilians in trouble? Hmm. Need to have regular updates on that, Oda, please. A flashback showing how much Leo loves Scarlet? Oh, yes! Gats's multiple commentaries, the countdown, Mansherry. I mean, I could go on and on. Stuff like this is littered throughout the arc to the point where it feels like it's more than the actual content. So, it's kind of like your average One Piece episode. Characters are shoehorned into the story and you don't really care about them. Meanwhile, the characters that you do care about, the Straw Hats, don't do much, and what's left is a bunch of interruptions to the things that you remain interested in, like Dofi, Law, Fuji, Sabo. There is a horrible balance between good and bad, which makes for a bad reading experience. And Drez Rosa's reading experience is so bad that it doesn't really matter how you experience it. If you read Drez Rosa Weekly, you probably have some form of PTSD. And if you binged it, then you probably skim through so many chapters that you don't even remember half of the bad stuff. Zoro's path through this arc is odd, to say the least. Things start off with Zoro arguing with Kinemon because Kinemon is freaking out again that Zoro has Shusui. Kinemon tells Zoro that he will duel him to return Shusui to Wano. As we know, this goes nowhere and is forgotten by the time we get to Wano. Zoro joins Luffy and company in walking around Dres Rosa, where Shusui gets stolen by Wika, who Zoro gives chase to for several chapters. When he finally catches her, Wika tells Zoro that the Dofi family went out to attack the Straw Hats on the Sunny. Zoro wants to go save the crew, but he doesn't know where he's going, so him and Wika make an agreement to go to the flower field. Skip forward in time to when Frankie arrives with Kuros at the Tentata base, Zoro is already there cheering for Luffy in the fight. Zoro literally forgets that Nami's group was being attacked by the Doflamingo family and that's what he wanted to do. Sick. After remembering, Zoro starts to head back to the ship, but he meets Sanji along the way. And instead of Zoro going to help the Straw Hats, Sanji does instead. Zoro then meets Kitimon and stands outside of the Colosseum until he runs into Bart. And there he's just big chillin' until there's a confrontation with Fuji. Once Luffy leaves the Colosseum, Zoro goes with Luffy to the palace. Then runs into Pika and spends almost the rest of the arc getting stalled by him until Oda is ready to end things. In which, Oda gives Pika swords for no reason other than to throw in the weakest sword shit for Zoro. After that, Zoro spends time pushing against the birdcage instead of cutting it. Unlike Fuji, who was playing a game of waiting for other people to take the glory for his main point to get like highlighted, Zoro doesn't have any reason to not cut the birdcage and eliminate the threat of it, bar him having the same motives as Fuji and intentionally doing this to make Luffy look good. This, alongside literally every other person not cutting it, that has the strength to, led to the meme that the birdcage is the strongest move in the entire series. In reality, Oda has a hard-on for time bombs because he thinks they work and add tension, even if they don't. So nobody in the arc takes action to do anything logical against it. And that is the end of Zoro and Dresrosa. Obviously, 
there wasn't any plan for Zoro in this arc. Now, I think there was potential for more with Zoro and Wika, who are all right together in terms of dynamics, but as it stands, I don't know why they even met. I don't understand what was going through Oda's mind. Shusui gets stolen, which was emphasized at the beginning of the arc by Kinemon that he cared about it, and the only purpose for it being stolen was for Zoro to meet Wika and nothing else. It's pointless and literally doesn't matter. Zoro doesn't gain anything from sitting in the flower field base just to meet Frankie when his original objective was to save the Straw Hats. And ultimately, Sanji is the one to go, not Zoro. So Zoro finding out about the Straw Hats being in trouble was also pointless. The only thing that happens is that Zoro forgets that his friends are in danger, which is not a good look, obviously. Zoro's primary function in the arc is to stand around until Pika is introduced. Zoro cutting Pika in half is cool, right? But overall, the fight sucks because of the way it was structured. Having Zoro get stalled out for 20 plus chapters against an opponent who is significantly weaker than he is, with nothing interesting happening between them as characters, makes it very unsatisfying because then what do you have to remember when looking back on it? The fight sucked, and all you can do is just wank Zoro cutting them out in half. That's it. This is an instance where length and substance matter. There is no substance and only length. And what's more is that this is essentially the last thing Zoro does in the post time skip until Wano. He has some dialogue in Zo, but there's no conflict in that arc so Zoro doesn't really do anything. And obviously Zoro isn't in Whole Cake Island. To review Zoro in totality, Zoro bodies Hody underwater on Fishman Island and fights Hyozo, then Zoro is the worst he's ever been in the entire series in Punk Hazard, and now in Dresrosa, He's once again not challenged and mostly just there to one-shot somebody. His highlight moments are once again that slice on Pika, clashing with Fuji, who wasn't really even trying, and then having a Mihawk flashback. Which are fine. Overall though, no point, no plot lines, nothing super defining for Zoro, and no struggle. I went over a lot of this in my analysis on his dream, but it helps to show you as the events are occurring in the arcs themselves. These arcs will seem like a bigger wasted opportunity in the future when we talk about how Oda destroyed the power scaling within the Straw Hats. Next up is Nami. Nami's venture in this arc is short since she's in the part of the group that leaves early, but that doesn't mean there's nothing to talk about. Nami's part within the arc is all centralized on staying in the sunny while the rest of the crew go out to attempt the swap with Caesar. And there's an underrated scene here. Uh, with Nami, Brook, and Chopper playing Shogun with Momo. This ends up being a continuation of Oda's newly introduced mechanic for Nami, which is her care for children, because she gets to dote on Momo. But it's also good for Momo because it adds a layer onto the trauma he has from the past. It's fairly accurate, too. Playing with him so he doesn't get sad makes the dynamic he has with the Straw Hats, specifically Nami, feel stronger, which I was a fan of. Unfortunately, Oda will ruin this when we get to Wano. After this scene, Giola somehow sneaks her way onto the men's room in the sunny. I don't know how she did that, but she did. It becomes known to the crew because of Viola that the Straw Hats are being attacked on the ship. And I want to stick here for a moment and highlight this. Because what happens is a microcosm of a bigger issue in One Piece at large. Alright, so let's run it down. After learning of the attack, Sanji is worried and wants to go help Nami right away. But he's on the phone with Frankie, and Frankie says, What, do you really think she's still just a delicate little flower? She'll be fine. <laughs> a fa. When we get back to the crew, they have been outmatched by Giola. Nami's body has been turned into a gag with no boobies, which, as we'll see, ends up being the only thing Nami is good for in the post-time skip. Nami and company all end up being defeated by Giola, and the only reason they get out of the situation is because of a gag with Brooke, which makes it an illegitimate win. <sighs> Alright dude, a uh, couple things here. The fact that Oda tried to hype up Nami with Frankie alongside, you know, Chopper and Brooke, only to have them get sauced on by horrible, smelly Giola and not redeem themselves, and for all to mean nothing, is criminal. Oda gives them a Mickey Mouse win, and the main takeaway is that they suck, and your time was wasted. Nami has another nice scene later on in this arc, but the things that are starting to matter more are getting thrown by the wayside. 
we're running into an issue that is only getting worse with the main straw hats, and that is their progress from the time skip and the necessity of the time skip in general. Is there any difference from pre to post? What was the two years good for outside of Luffy getting stronger? Did it accomplish anything other than Zoro and Sanji getting base level hockey and no legitimate power-ups? The answer is starting to become more clear. Nami's other good scene that I mentioned is when she gives her speech prior to the Straw Hats heading to Zoe, but it comes after another sour moment when the weakling Straw Hats freak out and essentially admit defeat as soon as Dofi sets their eyes on them. Not only is this sorta lame to see, because the Straw Hats have more than what Oda lets them use in the story to defend themselves, but it's also a missing part of what begins to happen in Whole Cake Island, which is the Straw Hats acting tough with no change or storyline to accompany it. They cower in fear in front of Dofi and then act tough in front of Big Mom and people say, oh my god, go, when it's really not. A big takeaway with Nami here is that in Dres Rosa alone, she's only in for a handful of scenes. But in those handful of scenes are two bad ones and a couple good ones. The negatives far outweigh the positives in this scenario because the positives are starting to become throwaway moments that don't have any substance as the story's progression and the Straw Hat's role in that progression seems more minimal and not important to Luffy's dream. Now let's go on with Sanji. Sanji's time in Dres Rosa can be broken down into three sections. Sanji and Viola, Sanji vs. Dofi, and then Sanji vs. the Big Mom Pirates. In my book, Sanji's best scene is not in any of these sections. I prefer the small interaction between him and Law shortly after the Dofi encounter. There is a portion of this arc where Law is beginning to lose sight of what he's tricked the Straw Hats into believing, which is that everything in Dres Rosa is just a step to Kaido. That's what the Straw Hats believe. But the reality is that this is a ploy and Law doesn't actually care. The only thing he cares about is Dofi. When Law starts to hyper-focus on Dofi, he starts letting people see his hand and then Sanji calls him out on his priorities, which I like. Outside of this scene, I think Sanji is good against the Big Mom Pirates. I don't think Sanji gets enough credit whenever he plays a leader-like role within the crew. And then, the stuff with Viola I consider a wasted opportunity because of Viola's character or lack thereof. I'm not a fan of this section, I think it has issues which I'll get into later. Overall though, I find Sanji's role with Viola switching sides to be rather cheap, but I'm not going to linger on it. Sanji vs. Dofi is a scene that has a negative aspect to it and belongs in a discussion concerning the bigger, overarching narrative in the story that I began in Punk Hazard. And that is Oda's obsession with putting Sanji in bad spots and limiting his options of rebuttal so he can make other characters look good or make Sanji look bad in comparison. So to recap, Sanji switched jobs with Zoro in the mission to save the Straw Hats. And when Sanji arrives on the scene to save them from Dofi, Oda has Dofi block Sanji's Diablo Jambe with his feather coat, with no hardening hockey, fuck him up, and then immobilize Sanji with the plot device move Parasite. Dofi is then about to kill Sanji when Law, who has been putting in work already, comes in to save Sanji and take his place in fighting Dofi. This is a bad example of favoritism. In a hypothetical situation, had Zoro never switched with Sanji and he had been the one to come rescue the Straw Hats, Oda never would have had Zoro get pieced up by Dofi. We know this because Oda made sure that Zoro did something in response to Fuji back near the Colosseum and then again later in the arc off screen. And despite Fuji barely using any of his power, Zoro manages to come out looking good against a significantly stronger opponent. This is a concentrated effort by Oda to make Zoro look good. And the same can't be said for Sanji. People need to call it out. It's only because it's Sanji that Oda did it this way. Sanji is Oda's proverbial punching bag, and I don't agree with this action, especially if you are reading the story up to this point in time from the time skip. Sanji is technically in a life or death situation, and the scene was made out so that Sanji could maybe have a shining moment and you'd expect him to have more in his bag coming out of the time skip than just Skywalk. From a writing perspective, you obviously don't want Sanji to look better than Dofi because Dofi is the main antagonist and would undermine the entire arc if Sanji like beat Dofi there on the spot, right? But there are so many different ways to have Sanji be strong enough to divert 
or put up some semblance of a fight against Dofi until Law tags into the fight, without making Sanji look like garbage. Sanji can still get messed up in the process to make Dofi look good, but then make Sanji look good as well, and that way everyone wins. Instead, Sanji gets back down in the post and Oda makes Dofi look like Prime Shaq at Sanji's expense. What matters here is the way things look. You could look at numerous points in the pre-time skip for examples of better methods of utilizing Sanji's character in the same manner that Oda tried to here. As a matter of fact, many people's favorite Sanji scene is a scene where Sanji gets absolutely shit on by Anel. Anel is such a ridiculously strong character at that point in time in Skypiea, but Oda manages to make the highlight of that scene of Sanji being defeated to be that Sanji is awesome. And at the same time, Enel looks good because he defeats Sanji. Oda didn't compromise either character unjustly. But as we see in the post time skip, that balance is gone. All in all, I'd say Sanji came out even in this arc, or maybe potentially negative, depending on how much you value the Sanji and Dofi conversation. Choppers up to bat next. Gay. Usopp's role in Drizzt Rose is the only time in the time skip where he's involved in, well, anything really. And in my opinion, I think there are some signs that there were supposed to be more with Usopp in this arc, but Oda decided to drop it as the events and the length of the arc started to unfold. As I mentioned in part 1, we know that Drizzt Rose is the combination of two islands the Straw Hats were supposed to visit. One was what Drizzt Rose is as we know it, you know, Love Island, and the other is a separate island in the adventure for the Tentadas. And I would say that in the combination of islands to form the narrative of Dresrosa, that the purpose and meaning of the Tentadas as a group was lost in translation. There are a few obvious connections to Usap that didn't really go anywhere during the arc. One being that the Tentadas live on a flora island and are masters in growing and cultivating plants, which is Usap's specialty coming out of the time skip. Usap learns nothing from the Tentadas, which, uh... That doesn't make any sense, because you'd think that would be an obvious pre-gone conclusion for Usopp getting something, because that's what they specialize in. If there's something in common, then, you know, as a reader, you expect something to come of it. But that doesn't happen. Two, we know that the Tentadas were saved by Nolan in the distant past. This is another, more obvious connection to Usopp that Oda seems to be going for, that is more involved than the lost opportunity for Usopp learning something from the Tentadas. But the fact that there isn't anything more to this, and Nolan's lore in the arc ends up being heavily, heavily understated, is, it's, it's a bit odd. Last time we had a Nolan conversation going on, it was fully integrated into the Skypea plotline and themes, and we got a lot of mileage out of it. That was not the case here, and I think it's a shame because it could have been used greatly in tying together a better written character plotline for Usopp. And now, it could be that from the beginning that we were never supposed to get more Nolan stuff here, but it's kind of hard to say. I think the Tentadas, without their main purpose being connected to either of those plot lines, which are Usopp-centric, result in them being more of a plague on the arc than anything else. Especially because the only thing they are good for after leaving Greenbit for the Invasion Day is to take up screen time and to introduce the dreadful Rescue Man Sherry subplot. Which, once again, doesn't have anything to do with Usopp, so it does absolutely nothing for the arc. I've seen it be the case before that the scene where Usopp runs away and abandons the Tentadas and Robin ends up being a jarring scene for Usopp fans. The continuous flip-flopping from Usopp and Cowardice can be very taxing as a reader, and I think people were expecting more from him coming out of the time skip. And I can't blame people for feeling this way because I think the time skip promised things and continuously failed to deliver on them. This feeling of frustration could have gone away if there was a plotline around it in the beginning to unravel here in Dres Rosa. I put it out there myself. Just because Usopp has the body of a hero doesn't mean he's mentally a hero yet. And while Usopp does redeem himself by coming back to save quote unquote the Tentadas and Robin, it mostly ends up just being more of the same old same old, which means that it's kind of unsatisfying. Then Dres Rosa gives birth to the god Usopp meme which I don't really have a whole lot to say on in terms of what actually happened. It's a running gag, maybe a potential future plotline. Personally, I've been kind of 
turned away from this meme because of its rampant overuse in the community, but I still like its incorporation into the story. Usopp's big scene in this arc is where he comes in clutch for the sake of his friends and unlocks a new ability while under duress, a shonen classic. Theoretically, this moment opens the door for a lot of things in the future with Usopp. Unfortunately, because of Wano, it's hard to look at this Usopp scene the same as I did when it first happened. As I said, Usopp unlocking Observation Hockey in this moment comes off as the beginning move in a series of events planned for Usopp to become stronger and learn new things, which is great. But in retrospect, it feels pointless because Usopp is useless and irrelevant in the arc that the entire post time skip ends up being built to. Usopp's Observation Hockey only shows itself in Dressrosa and is not expanded upon in Wano, even though he's at war with two Yonko at the same time. That doesn't make any sense. I don't know how you have those stakes in theory and don't use it as an opportunity to grow Usopp more from what you started here in Dressrosa. This is a condemnation on Wano, but this is something that is so apparent that it makes Dressrosa look worse. I'd also like to take a moment to mention another lost opportunity with Usopp's role in the arc, by talking about the person that Usopp ultimately defeats, Sugar. Now, as it stands, Sugar is a meme character, a plot device character who has an overpowered ability, something that I have no issue with, but there is something that doesn't really make any sense to me. Alright, and here it is. Monet and Sugar are sisters that Dofi rescued and brought into the family, right? This is information we get from outside sources. Monet died in Punk Hazard, but she's never brought up as a reference in Dress Rosa with Sugar, her sister. Which is, you know, it's kind of odd. You feel like if someone's sister died, and then the very next arc where the other sister is, that'd be brought up, but I, I guess not. I'd like to think that when we get to Elbath, there will be a lot of things for Usopp, but I don't think it's ever going to make up for Usopp not being useful in Wano. I disagree heavily with the idea of keeping a character in the background for 400 plus chapters and needing to wait for one minor arc to include fundamental aspects of progression. Usopp's time in Dresrosa is ultimately bittersweet. Alright, so for Robin, there is a little bit to talk about. Robin starts the arc on the Caesar exchange team with Law and Usopp. There's no plot reason for why she's really with them. It's mainly for fan service and so that midgets can crawl all over her body and pop out of her cleavage to give exposition. Robin then shows in the background of panels, like usual, for the next dozen and a half chapters until they overhear what happened in Dofi's rise to power over Dresrosa. This is where I think there's clearly, clearly, a missed opportunity or some type of connection missing with one of the characters in the arc. During this recounting of Dofi's rise to power, there is a lot of attention on Robin's reactions to the news. She's shown to be thinking of things, and then she says that she can't forgive Dofi for his actions, which is very rare. You wouldn't expect Robin, of all people, to say something like that. But it makes more sense for her to care now than it does in the past. Drez Rosa is an example of a peaceful place being overthrown and turned into a hellhole. Robin is a proxy revolutionary and she learned about things over the time skip that could all reasonably make her care more about what's going on in the world and the revolutionary cause for change. Her caring more about Drezdoza makes sense at a base level. Robin's dialogue here in this exchange don't translate to anything within her character, and I find this particularly odd because the revolutionaries are introduced in this arc, and the only thing they really do is fuck with the weapon boxes. It feels like there should have been something going on here. I mean... Even CP0 was in this arc, and they could have been used for more than what they were against the revolutionaries to do something. It just feels so out of place. The next thing Robin is involved with is her being in the squad that is supposed to deal with Sugar. And Robin has a little run here where she pretends to be a guard and then gets out of danger when her cover's blown against trouble and you're like, you know, that's nice. Then she gets turned into a toy and then restored pretty quickly. This probably could have been used to a greater degree for Usopp's plotline in the arc so that his desire to remember Luffy and save him comes off as a bit more epic and emotional. Because Robin being turned into a toy and then being forgotten, then remembered, um, it didn't really seem like that big of a deal. But back to Robin's recounting in the arc. After the, when she gets turned back into a toy, she sort of just sits around on the plateau while their group is being chased by fodder. 
Then she's flying through the air on the Tentatas, gets attacked by Gladius, momentarily stops him from hitting other people out of the sky, and uh, for a second here, it looks like Robin and Bart are going to team up to take on Gladius. She has a nice line saying Luffy is the trump card, and everyone likes that. Then Bart tells Robin to go ahead and just like leave it to him, and this is something I don't really understand. Robin's goal is essentially to help Rebecca. I don't know why though. Robin and Rebecca have no connection whatsoever. They don't interact in the entirety of the arc, and there's not a whole lot gained from having this be Robin's thing for the arc to begin with. It doesn't end up tying to anything we talked about in terms of missed opportunities with like the revolutionaries and Dofi, and Kuros was going to end up at the top of the plateau on the flower field anyway. So what Robin gets to do is go up to the flower field and essentially stand around and watch Kiros fight. And then to only just put her hands up to protect Rebecca from the falling spikes. And that's like, that's it. That's all Robin does for the rest, rest of the arc, essentially. There's no alternate universe here where maybe Robin could have played a bigger role against Diamante because it just wouldn't be good. Diamante is a strictly Rebecca and Kiros thing. And it just seems like Oda didn't really have a whole plan for Robin. And this is what he gave her to have her get something to quote unquote do. But I guess to Robin's credit, it's not like it's bad. Her doing these little things here and there aren't in any way detrimental to her character. But like I said, a lot of the Straw Hats play second fiddle to the side characters in this arc and aren't really that involved, which ends up being a weakness for the arc overall, in my opinion. This will be the fourth arc in a row of the Straw Hats playing it safe and not doing much at all. That is 200 plus chapters in total at this point in a time skip where the main characters are just like walking around. That doesn't really seem right considering when you come off of the time skip as a reader, the first thing you want to see is like the main characters. <laughs> so while getting tiny nods during large arcs isn't bad per se, I don't think it's good either because you end up sacrificing these characters. Uh, but you know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Robin isn't bad in Dress Rosa, she's just meh. For a vast majority of Dress Rosa, Luffy is fine. Um, there are ups and downs. His fight with Shin Zhao is boring and the Uzi stuff is, yeah. But his interactions with Bellamy are mostly good. Luffy ends up just getting stalled out too long by him before Doofy. That's the only like brown spot with the entire Bellamy section. The Saba interactions get a thumbs up from me and so do the Blackbeard ones. Um, which I think have a lot of potential. If there's anything that I would really like Oda to land for sure in the future outside of like legacy characters, I would really want him to nail down the dynamic between Luffy and Blackbeard because I think it has a lot of potential. Outside of that, there are some corny scenes with Luffy, like when people are laughing at Rebecca and Luffy's like, her der, she gave me food, don't laugh at her. All right, you know, charismatic as usual, I suppose, but not a big deal. Dres Rosa in general is mostly remembered for Dofi... Law's flashback, and then Gear 4th. So that's where our discussion is going to go to. Gear 4th. I didn't read Joe's Rosa Weekly. Um, I came into the weekly grind partway through Zoe, so there are some community opinions in the heat of the moment that I don't know because I wasn't there. Luckily, though, I have friends who were there, so I can trust their opinion on what they say it was like. Uh, Gear 4th, when it came out, was a bit controversial from a design perspective because it kind of looked goofy to some people, but I would say that it grew on those people over time once they saw what it was capable of. Me personally, I have always liked the design of Gear 4th. I think it's cool. I like it. Hype is a word synonymous with Gear 4. Personally, I don't know if any attack or form in the series is ever going to reach the same hype I had whenever I saw Luffy go Gear 2nd for the first time or Zoro's Shishi Sum Sum on Kuma. But Gear 4th is probably the closest thing to those two hype moments. Gear 4 isn't perfect though, um, and unfortunately looking back on Gear 4th in retrospect makes things a bit bittersweet because future arcs take away from it quite a bit I'd say. What I'm about to talk about is minor, but entertain me. I think it was a mistake to make Luffy use Gear 4th twice to defeat Dofi. Gear 4 at that point in time was Luffy's trump card, right? All versions of it. But Bound Man was for speed, strength, uh, durability, and to end things as fast as humanly possible in a fight. The time limit and hockey usages 
are brought up during Luffy's first go around in Gear 4, so that sets the stage for its weakness and limits. And I think that setting up the concept of its limits and then to have Luffy immediately fail his first go around is deflating. And even more so when you look at future arcs, because as it stands, Bowman has failed to do its job every single time Luffy has used it. It has never gone a complete W. The entire point of Bowman was to use it to be the final aspect of a fight so you can get the W the first time around. Like Luffy's not planning to lose in it. But that's what he does. Luffy failed to beat Delphi the first time, failed to beat Cracker, Katakuri countered it, and it just doesn't work on Kaido. Now you see what I mean? Giving Luffy a full dub on Dofi while showing Gear 4 has limits sets him up better for when Luffy needs something more than Gear 4 going into future arcs. There's no good narrative around Gear 4 and its hockey issues that it has aren't incorporated very well into the story in terms of like finding an issue or building up on them. So, you know, looking back, it's why did Oda even introduce it to the first place if he wasn't going to focus on it, at least not yet. There's a friend I have in the community who always used to meme and say that Gear 4 sucks, and I would always be flabbergasted by it. But that claim makes a lot more sense now because of how often it doesn't work. But like I said, this does end up being a minor thing for me. There's a lot more in this arc that I think matters more. But looking at an arc is a cumulative effort, so when you think about it, you gotta think about everything all at once. Let's move on to the one thing at the end of the arc which does cause an issue for me. When Fuji is chasing Luffy at the end of the arc, Luffy is attacking him and he says, Who says I have to run? Just because you're an admiral? That pattern ended two years ago. I'm not running away anymore. I have no problem with Luffy saying this. As a matter of fact, I think it's cool. It shows that something from the pre-time skip has stuck to him. Into the post-time skip, for better or for worse, however you want to argue it. This should be a motivation, because it's a promise from Luffy to himself that he needs to back up with his actions. The writing issue here is that Luffy contradicts this statement in Whole Cake Island. He goes back on his word and it's never addressed. Which, if a character says something and they mean it and it's supposed to matter, then the narrative should address it. Like, it shouldn't just be something you gloss over and pretend it didn't happen and sweep it under the rug with everything else that's under the rug. So I definitely think this is a mess up. There are also another few things involved with Luffy and Dres Rosa considering his character that don't make a whole lot of sense to me. One is what we just went over. Another is the length that Oda goes through with Luffy and Sabu in comparing Dres Rosa to Goa Kingdom. It happens a few times, where Oda goes out of his way to have Sabu and Luffy comment on the state of Dres Rosa and how it's run, and then they both relate it to their past. But then nothing is done with it. It's a comment and then nothing more. Um, now, it probably makes less sense for this to happen with Sabo because he's a revolutionary. And what's happening in Dres Rosa is a microcosm of what should have made him want to leave and change his life to become a revolutionary in the first place. Which in turn, should make Sabo want to change Dres Rosa while he's there. Or at the least, uh, lead to something other than an offhand comment. Uh, but this is just another argument for how wasted and bad the revolutionaries have been in the story. Uh, Sabo is reintroduced into the story as a revolutionary, but he doesn't really do any revolutionary stuff in the arc. Which seems... I don't know, man. Not good. There is also an opportunity here with Luffy as well, in my opinion. Because with Sabo, it makes sense to talk about how there should have been more. But with Luffy, it's a bit more questionable, because you would not expect Luffy to make this connection to begin with because Luffy's not much of a thinker in terms of bringing these thematics together. And considering Luffy's speech to the people of Wano and Udon, perhaps the argument could be made that Dres Rosa could, should have been, a starting point for Luffy taking a bigger, more active leadership role in the liberation of Dres Rosa. Hmm. Just a thought. Just a thought. I'd like to take some time to talk about a few of the better side characters in Dres Rosa, like Senior Pink, Bellamy, Bart, and Cavendish. Out of the Grand Fleet, Bart and Cavendish are easily the standout characters. Both have solid interactions with Luffy, and moments where they get their shine or some nice character nods. When you think of the Grand Fleet, they are probably the first people to come to mind. Between the two, I only have criticisms for Bart. I don't really have much to say about Cavendish other than, you know, I like him. He's cool, I guess. 
the thing with Bart is that there's just not a good balance between whenever he's a fanboy versus what seems to be his normal personality, which is that of sort of a badass, bad person. I'm happy with Bart overall in the story. I like the gag just as much as anyone else, but I would prefer to see a better use of his character in terms of balancing the act between gags, which Oda doesn't really have a good track record of doing. Senior Pink is pretty obvious. He is a good addition into the arc. Um, it's not like his fight itself is all that great. A vast majority of it is just Senior Pink and Frankie taking turns suplexing each other, which isn't all that entertaining. But that's just one aspect. Uh, when you look at it, Frankie is essentially irrelevant to the Senior Pink fight. He just happens to be a player in the memeage that's going on. Senior Pink is just a character in the arc that has a very good backstory that comes out of nowhere. And that's all that needs to be said of Senior Pink. He is an extra in the arc that has a shining moment and something to remember him by, which is good. I don't think there should have been a whole lot more for his character. I think what he got was enough. Here's where we get into some deeper critical talk. Out of all of the quote-unquote important characters in this arc, it's most common to see split opinions and more voiced grievances when it comes to Sabo. And the common grievances really just boil down to two things. One... Sabo being alive is seen as a retcon slash ass pull. And two, Sabo comes off as Ace 2.0 instead of Sabo. I disagree with the idea that Sabo being alive is a retcon. It's impossible for us to say how early Oda had the foundation for the ASL flashback planned. We know for sure Sabo was a character before he was ever mentioned because of Ace's tattoo. But outside of that, we have no way of knowing how long the idea of Sabo being alive was planned. And if we want to be realistic, there's probably more than enough reason to doubt it was always planned. Ace's origins as a character definitely changed since his conception, since he wasn't always supposed to be the son of Roger. That was a twist Oda came up with that shocked his editors during Marineford. Maybe the same applies to Sabo? Who knows? I do think Oda had the idea of Sabo being alive planned from the point in time Ace mentioned his name during his death scene to the end of the ASL flashback. Looking back with us knowing Sabo is alive is kind of unfair, but the possibility for Sabo being alive was always present. Dragon's presence within Goa, his interactions with Sabo, give you more than enough reason to suspect something could have happened because Dragon being there needed a greater reason. We never saw Sabo's body, and it's only assumed that he's dead. A classic fakeout. And the manner that he went out in, getting shot on the boat, only leaves more room for the idea of him escaping, and there's no foul play with the concept of Sabo being alive. What I do agree with is the claim that there is a huge, egregious ass pull in Sabo's writing. The use of amnesia to justify why Sabo wasn't in Marineford to help Ace is not only bad, it makes no sense. Amnesia is a trope that has quite the murky history when it comes to reader reception, and as we'll find out when we get to Wano, Oda labricks both his attempts at this trope. One of the reasons that Amnesia has a bad track record is because in many cases, it's used to cause drama and the drama isn't that good, or it's an excuse to cover up a glaring plot hole in the writing. Now for me, I'm pretty lenient on the idea depending on my trust in the author using that trope, and if it ends up being a rewarding experience. I'm not going to instantly shit on the idea if there's a possibility for greater good coming out of it. But this is undoubtedly being used to cover up a plot hole here when it comes to Sabo. When Sabo got lit up, kuh, you find me? He got amnesia and lost his memory and shit. And when he woke up in the bed, he had no idea of who he was other than the fact that his name was Sabo and he never wanted to go back to Goa again. Fair enough. However, Sabo regains his memory because he overhears and reads the newspaper confirming Ace's death? And that's when it all comes rushing back? If Sabo was in a remote part of the One Piece world, had no contact or awareness of what was going on at any point in time, then well, I mean, it'd still be a stretch and unsatisfying, but it'd be more logical than what we got here. So, sorry, this does not work. Sabo is a part of the Revolutionary Army, a group that already keeps track of pirates as evidenced by them getting the newspaper and dragon learning of Luffy. They are aware of world events, and it's very unlikely that the top brass of the Revolutionary Army 
aren't knowledgeable of the strongest warriors in the world, especially under Yonko Cruz. Their commanders and their history should be something that's known to the most important people in the world. They could have heard of Ace when he was on a Whitebeard's crew. They could have heard of him prior to being on the crew when he was tussling with Jinbei and was a potential warlord candidate. Not only that, but the Revolutionary Army would have received the exact same news coup that Luffy did, saying that Ace was captured and he was going to be executed. Random people on unknown islands all over the world knew that Whitebeard was going head-to-head -head with the world government to save Ace. No matter how you try to slice it, Sabo, some way or another, would have known, and heard of Ace prior to when it was shown to him in the flashback. And if hearing that Ace is going to be executed doesn't knock him out of amnesia, then that's an even lamer excuse. As soon as Oda decided to make Saba part of the Revolutionary Army, this amnesia trope was doomed to fail if Oda's only answer to it was, well, I read the newspaper after the fact. You know, I can, uh, I can barely think of any ideas off the top of my head that would have worked for Sabo outside of Sabo still having amnesia by the point in time he met Luffy and Drez Rosa, and maybe through a series of other events that happened in Drez Rosa, that's how Sabo regained his memories. It should come as no surprise then, that just based off of this alone, there are people who have put up quite the strong barrier of resistance and expressed issues with Sabo and Drez Rosa. His reintroduction feels very cheap, and it leaves behind a bit of a taint on the whole Ace, Sabo, and Luffy dynamic, and the tragedy of Marineford, because one of the aspects of going on in Marineford is that Luffy lost both his brothers, not just one, and the other one was kind of like memed to be alive. I don't think this is something that can even be contested, to be honest. We all know this isn't a good excuse. It's just up to you whether or not you can look past this writing error and what it means. I think it's fair game one way or another and I'm a bit in the middle in regards to my own feelings. I recognize and understand that this is really bad writing, but I can also see the possibility of Sabo's role within the story providing enough quality and good moments to override the egregious aspect of his reintroduction, but it's really dependent on what happens with Sabo in the future. In my eyes, the biggest issue with Sabo isn't the amnesia stuff. Sabo's biggest issue is that the revolutionaries suck. Their role in place in the story and how Oda has written them has not been good. And because the claim of Sabo being Ace 2.0 is something that actually has merit to it, in order to beat the allegations, Sabo's goals and desires with the Revolutionary Army need to be incorporated into the story to make him stand out so he can be his own character. And these are things we'll continue to talk about later when we get to the Reverie. But as it pertains to Dres Rosa, Sabo is mostly good. There are a couple scenes that stand out as things that work towards Sabo's path of redemption. One being Sabo's conversation with Koala, where we get to see the concerns and guilt that Sabo has and his fear of meeting Luffy. And the second being Sabo's confrontation with Burgess, which you could take as a direct contrast to Ace's actions in Marineford. Regardless of your stance and feelings towards Sabo, the issues that encompass his character serve a minor role in the story of like Dres Rosa as an arc which in of itself might be its own problem considering how the revolutionaries are utilized, but hey. It's time to tackle the two arc princesses. And first at the bat is the least important of them, Viola. As far as in arc events go, there's not much to talk about. In the beginning, we know she tricks Sanji into being isolated. Then after a corny one-liner, she immediately switches sides and then we get the laydown of what happened with CP0. Oda writes off the little romance between her and Sanji, which I think is a tad bit unfortunate because it had more potential, but I'll uh, touch on that a bit more later. As it stands, the Sanji-Viola stuff is used and will most likely only be used in the future for Sanji's pervert gags. Woo. Post writing off the Sanji-Viola stuff, Viola mainly gives out directions and updates on things happening in the arc with her devil fruit. If you are looking at her just based on that... The most you could really say is that she is a character that most people simp because she's hot and that's it. So what's the problem? Viola is included here for critical discussion because the little character integrity she had basically gets thrown out the window in an SBS volume. And specifically SBS volume 83. Here's how it goes. 
A fan asks Oda, Why did Viola and Doflamingo call each other Dofi and Violet in chapter 788? Oda responds with, There is a deep secret setting I can't tell you about. I informed the supervisor about it, but since it is a pretty adult part of the story, it remains hidden in the shonen manga which One Piece is. To all adults, please try to imagine yourselves. Dres Rosa truly is a passionate country. I feel like this should be self-evident, uh, but, but I'll explain it. It's one thing if Oda excluded something out of the story because it's rated R and he wanted to keep things PG-13 in a show in a magazine, at least as far as romance is concerned. Oda has hinted at darker things before, and it's been more than enough to get the message across. But it is a completely different matter altogether to write an arc and a character in Viola, a stereotypical damsel in distress, on the surface, who was also the queen of Dresrosa, to then be someone who banged and was involved in a relationship with the Ark's major villain, the same dude who took over her country, enslaved it, and destroyed the entire royal family she's a part of. I don't care if you want to argue about them banging. I think Oda's statement is pretty transparent, but if you want to dispute it, whatever. It doesn't even matter. The point still stands that the relationship between Dofi and Viola is canon. It's an intentional part of Dres Rosa's writing, and it turns Viola from just another person in the One Piece verse into one of three things. One, an unsympathetic character that banged Dofi and went along with his plans while doing nothing to oppose them, and Oda is trying to sell this person as a good-hearted woman that needs to be saved and you, the audience, should care about. Two, a severely underwritten character that requires a lot more writing nuance to explain and, ex and expand upon the relationship between her and Dofi in order to make it make sense in the narrative or to tell a story with it. Or three, an idiot. After learning about this, there's no way to unsee Viola and Dres Rosa as a portion of the arc that's honestly nonsensical and jarring. There was a way where something legit could have come of this. Whether it's telling a story between her and Dofi to what I mentioned earlier, which is a connection to the dropped Sanji romance and something that happens with their time together that makes her see the light or something. But that didn't happen. And the result is that Viola's character was assassinated. She is a bad character and a hoe. And that's really just the truth of it. But now it's time to go to Rebecca. Rebecca is one of the emotional cores of this arc. She's introduced very early, and Oda spends a long time incorporating her into the story. Compared to Viola, Rebecca is significantly more important. And you'll see that it's now starting to become a trend for Oda to fumble the bag with his princess characters. With the inclusion of Viola, Rebecca is now the third princess since the time skip began where things go south with her writing. But there's a bit of a story to tell in her downfall because Rebecca did not start out bad. In fact, I'd say that Oda did a pretty good job of introducing Rebecca initially and crafting a relationship between her and Kuros. I'm going to do a bit of recap here with Rebecca so I can paint the picture of what exactly happens to her within this arc. We first meet Rebecca in the Colosseum with Luffy in front of the Kuro statue that Luffy is admiring. Rebecca is shown wanting to be just like Kuros. She's a female gladiator that comes off as proud, but we see that there's something more going on. The jeers and mocking of the other combatants is shown to bother her quite a bit. Rebecca states that she wants to win the competition in order to get the Mara Mara so that she can defeat Dofi. We see her first run in with Toy Soldier, and there's obviously some history between them. We don't know exactly what's going on. You know, not bad, right? We're cooking a bit. After Luffy's battle with Chin Zhao, he's running away from them when he runs into Rebecca, again, who buys him food with a little that she has. There's a little flashback to her childhood where her hunger ends up killing her mom, and Rebecca says that she doesn't get hungry. Rebecca then leads Luffy off near the injured gladiators in an attempt to get him out of the competition, which requires her to kill Luffy. She's hesitant, and Luffy is far out of her league, so he ends up easily disarming her. We hear again that Rebecca wants to win, get the Mara Mara, and defeat Dofi. So that's two times she stated this, but this time it's followed up by this statement. The toy soldier told me he was leading an army against Dofi today in order to save us, so I'm going to do it before him. I'm tired of the one being helped. This time I want to protect him. 
This sentence establishes what Rebecca wants, what she's working towards. Rebecca then walks into the arena and we get her full flashback, which is pretty good. Rebecca, inside of the arena, is more impressive than people give her credit for. She has observation hockey and is the only person in the arena capable of tracking and avoiding Hakuba's speed. Sabo, who was watching, even hypes Rebecca up by saying she was the only one who could tell what was happening. That's relevant. It sets expectations for the audience. And on top of this, Rebecca nerfs herself while fighting because she doesn't fight to hurt people, and her blade is dull on top of that. In the final round of the tourney, Rebecca has a confrontation with Diamante and starts fighting him with her dull ass sword and gets smacked around and Bart is ordered to protect her by Sabo. Fast forward a couple dozen chapters and the events of the arc are in full swing. Rebecca was trying to take the key to lost handcuffs over the Luffy, she met up with Robin and company trying to find Mancherry, blah blah blah, she remembers who Kiros is, blah blah blah, and then she comes face to face with Diamante. And what happens? The knowledge of Diamante killing Scarlet is so traumatizing to Rebecca, apparently, that she starts panicking and running away from Diamante saying, I don't want to fight anymore. Kill! Diamante taunts her, and she starts screaming and blubbering for Kiros to save her. And then one-legged Kiros shows up to save her, saying she's too kind-hearted to be a fighter, and she doesn't need to do anything anymore because daddy's here. And then she starts crying some more. As the fight against Diamante progresses with the one-legged Kuros, his one leg starts becoming a bit of a detriment, and then he gets taunted and made fun of by Diamante, which in turn makes Rebecca mad. While this is happening, by the way, Diamante is also telling Rebecca that she sucks. And then Kuros gets another moment saying Rebecca is kind, sweet, and doesn't hurt anybody, and blah blah blah, baby girl, and then Kuros wins the fight. Fast forward a dozen or more chapters again, Rebecca is running around the city as the barricade is closing, and uh, she's talking about how everyone's suffering, and she's ready to lay down her life to stop Doflamingo with her trash ass, and when she comes across Viola, who had the exact same trash idea. Rebecca immediately gets parasited by Dofi, and is crying and screaming more because she's being forced to fight Viola, and then she starts screaming, Help me, Lucy! Help me, Lucy! The countdown begins, Viola and Rebecca start crying more, and then Luffy comes and intervenes, and Rebecca screams again, Lucy! Lucy! And Luffy takes over the fight. And Luffy's reward for winning is Rebecca is crying more and then gives him a lap pillow after he wins, and her tears are just everywhere. Jesus Christ, dude. Rebecca goes from a character that wants to be like heroes, get the Mara Mara, defeat Dofi, and not be the person who was always protected, but instead be the person to protect, to the exact opposite of that. She becomes an incompetent mess, whose only function in the arc from the moment she sees Diamante is to scream, cry, and be saved constantly. And that is not an exaggeration. I understand that there is a story behind Kiros and Rebecca. Kiros is the father who redeems himself by protecting his family after failing to do so in the past. Cool. But there are two sides of this coin, dude. Both are important. One side of the coin is Kiros, who was fine, but the other side is Rebecca. What good comes to the more important character, Rebecca? The character who is a royal representative of Dresrosa, and is the one who goes to the reverie and starts talking to the people there from previous arcs. What happened to being the one to protect? What happened to the observation hockey that was hyped up by Sabo? Where is Rebecca's moment? It's one thing for Rebecca to end up as the person to ultimately be saved by Kiros, which, you know, that makes sense. But the least that could have happened is Rebecca stepping up to protect people like she wanted to. Even if that never happened, there should at least be something there to serve as a replacement. Her character needs something, but that's the problem. There's nothing. Rebecca is butchered and sacrificed for no reason. The only thing that's left is a crybaby. I said this in Fishman Island when talking about Shirahoshi, but I'll say it here again. There's nothing inherently wrong with crying and screaming in a vacuum. Those are just emotions. But if a character is only crying and screaming, that makes them no different than a, than a baby. If a character had agency and now has none, and you've reduced them down to the most bare elements of emotion, 
You've torn that character to shreds, and that's why Rebecca sucks and people don't like her. Her character goes from something to literally nothing, just another, just another girl. Ooh, oh, help me. Her legacy past Jez Rosa is that annoying princess girl who just screams Lucy. And the fact that it's Lucy makes it even worse. Now, you may care and like heroes, but you probably don't care about Rebecca. There is no satisfying payoff with Rebecca's character. Even in the epilogue when she gets to live with Kiros, the damage is already done. Rebecca's side of the story is ruined. This is a huge miss in the arc. If part of the emotional core doesn't work, it will matter more to the arc's quality than some other lesser problems. Rebecca, at the end of the day, is another poorly written female character in a growing line of them. And we're going to hop right in and add another one to that line. With a character that I have come to despise. Baby 5. Yeah, maybe that comes as a surprise to some people, but this character sucks. And what Oda tried to pull with it is absolute nonsense. Baby 5 is a character that is quote-unquote redeemed and then made into a good guy through the expansion of her gag being explained in her backstory. Which is a fine enough concept. But the execution is poorly written. The catalyst for Baby 5 changing sides is a single line of dialogue from Lao G, which tries to paint Baby 5 in a light in which they never cared about her. They only wanted Baby 5 on the squad as a useful henchman that could throw her body in and sacrifice herself for a mission. The reason why this is so awful is because it completely shits on the entire concept of the Do Flamingo family being a family. There is no legitimate justification for it. It's not like anyone else thinks it's a joke when people laugh at Pika's voice. The other members are genuinely mad at people of one of their own being mocked. And prior to this throwaway line from Lao Ji, there isn't any indication that the Do Flamingo family isn't genuine as a crew. Baby Five, Buffalo, and Law were all raised and grew up together under Dofi's wing, and they took care of each other. Even if Lao Ji's bum ass actually thinks that Baby Five is just a tool, it has nothing to do with how Dofi thinks of her or anyone else. These people were all loyal to Dofi first. Dofi is the one who saved Baby Five and rescued her. He's the one who came to her rescue multiple times when she was younger. Dofi even went out of his way to save Giola when he did not have to. Dofi is even shown helping Baby Five when she's introduced in Punk Hazard. Whenever we first see Baby Five, what's she doing? She's attacking Dofi because she's mad that he got rid of another person who asked her to do something. But the dude who asked Baby Five was a bum that was trying to take advantage of her. Dofi protected Baby Five by eliminating the bum. It's an insult to Dofi's character to pull this arc with Baby Five's character, and then to have her marry Sai as a finisher to the gag and have her leave the arc without any consequences. It also doesn't help that Oda makes Baby Five's already naive personality come across as just flat out stupid or disloyal. Pick your poison. Baby Five sucks because she hurts Dofi. Boo, Baby Five. You're gonna see a reoccurring theme among the characters in this arc. Even the good characters have an asterisk next to them. As far as Fuji is concerned, I put him on the same level as Dofi when it comes to the positives he brings to Dres Rosa. I even prefer him over Dofi as a character. Fuji manages to shine in this arc because of his side character status. Being an admiral prevents him from doing a whole lot that wouldn't immediately end the arc if he were allowed to do things. And that's always a concern when it comes to writing top tiers. And as an author, you have to write around what people that strong are capable of doing so that it doesn't destroy the plot. Oda, I would say, does a pretty good job of incorporating Fuji into this arc. There is purpose behind why Fuji holds himself back. Fuji's interactions with Sabu and Luffy are great, especially during his introduction. Fuji brings a lot of good to the arc, but there is still an asterisk nonetheless. It may not be obvious unless you look deeper into his character, or more importantly, the character that Fujitora has replaced. There is a scene within this arc which is contradictory and honestly insulting to a longtime character of the story. And that character is Smoka. At the end of the arc, when Fuji's actions become common knowledge and Fuji is arguing with Akainu, we see a small flashback to an interaction between Smoker and Fujitora. 
Smoker says, I believe the Seven Warlords should be disbanded. Two years ago, I was there in person when Crocodile's entire ruse was exposed for what it was. If it weren't for the Straw Hat crew, Alabasta would have sunk to being a pirate nation, just like Dresrosa now. But the government reported that this downfall was the work of the Navy. If only I had a higher rank back then. We then transitioned over to Smoker and Bannon just reading the newspaper saying, I'll be damned, Fuji really went and did it. I couldn't do the same thing even if I had his rank. Fuji is often associated with the entire premise of the Warlords being disbanded. But who was the character that was introduced and associated with it first? Whose perception of pirates was slightly altered? Who was the person who should at least be involved in spearheading its abolishment? Smoker. And here he is saying that he's too much of a coward to have done the same thing as Fuji given the opportunity and rank. That's bullshit. Smoker is a hard ass who told the government to eat shit. He'd do the same thing as Fuji if not more recklessly. And he's not even involved in the warlord abolishment process, despite being the dude to experience it first and then talk to Fuji about it. On top of this, Smoker and Tashigi's dialogue in Alabasta about getting stronger to overcome similar situations to what occurred with Crocodile will lead you to believe that Smoker would go out of his way to at the very least speak out against the warlord system. Put this on top of what we went over with these characters in Punk Hazard, and it really feels like they've been forgotten and changed compared to what they were like in the pre-time skip. Which is a shame because Smoker, in my opinion, is one of the best characters in the series before this point in time. We know that Smoker went to Vegapunk and will likely come back into the story different than he was before, maybe. But that doesn't change this aspect of the Warlords and Character Agency. Smoker's hypothetical role in the story was hijacked by Fujitora. Now, Fuji hijacked it in a beautiful way, but it's a hijacking nonetheless. And that's why there's an asterisk here. And an asterisk on this whole thing in general because at the end of the day, the abolishment of the warlords in the reverie is, uh, well, we'll get there when we get there. As far as the fan base is concerned, Dofi is the most infamous character to come out of this arc. He has a tendency to be a fan favorite, and I think there's good reason for it. Compared to the likes of Hoji Jones and Caesar Clown, two genuinely bad villains, Dofi's tenure as a villain in Dresrosa is a breath of fresh air, and you don't have to think too hard to see how much of an upgrade Dofi is compared to them. In every conceivable way, he's superior. In part one, I went over why Hoji Jones doesn't work as a villain, and to help show that, I laid out some very generic features most villains have that don't include character depth that usually work. Those features were charisma, character design, and strength. Chances are pretty good most of your favorite villains pass this test for you in one, if not all, of these categories. And of course, what it takes to pass this test changes for every person, but I'd say there's a bit of a science to things that usually work. As far as Dofi is concerned, I think most would agree with me in saying that he gets a passing grade on most, probably all of the categories, and that there is a higher sense of expectation in him as a villain. In part due to that passing grade, but also because of how long Dofi's been in the story and his affiliation to the Warlords. From the beginning, and especially from Marineford, you knew at some point in time, Dofi would show up again in a relevant way. It's nice that Dofi seems to have a good template as a villain, he's cool and shit, but what holds him together is how that template works in tandem with his character, because unlike Cody Jones, Dofi has character nuance that actually works. Despite being a villain, 
Dofi has his own code and things he values. The core of his character is that of a family man. Dofi genuinely cares about his people, and this is something that shows itself prior to Dresrosa, but is heavily incorporated into the arc itself. A lot of which I touched upon already with Baby 5. Oda goes a step beyond this though by incorporating Law's character into Dofi's. Some of the best parts of Dresrosa are the times when Dofi and Law get to talk to each other. Because there's stuff going on in the background of those characters that has meaning and drives these moments to be among the best the arc can offer. And that's something that normally works really well in the writing of villains in general. When villains have a character to interact and mingle with, you have the opportunity for a really good time. Despite all of his threatening dialogue towards Law, which Dofi has a lot of, Dofi has a personal investment to what he wants Law to be. Law does a lot of stuff to screw Dofi over, but there are times when it feels like Dofi could look past it all if Law just accepted defeat and joined him. The Heart Throne, which used to be where Corazon was, is empty and hasn't been filled for a reason. That's because Dofi wants Law to take that spot. Dofi sees himself in Law, and because of that, Dofi cares. Dofi wants Law to be what Corazon was to him. Precious. A brother. And how Dofi feels makes sense. Law as a kid is the embodiment of Dofi. They both crave to cause as much chaos as humanly possible. They were both angry because of what happened to them. One of my favorite scenes in Dress Rosa is when Dofi is reading up on Florence in his free time to learn more about Law as a kid. And then he falls asleep and has a nightmare of his own past. Which just goes to show you how much Dofi relates to Law. And that connection makes Dofi accept Law into the family, give him access to resources to be a doctor, and learn how to fight. There's also an odd detail here in this scene which, to be honest, I wish was more apparent and incorporated into the arc, but I don't see it as a flaw that it's not. It's more like an easter egg. And I'll tell you what I'm talking about. So, amongst the One Piece community, there's an ongoing meme wondering what's behind Dofi's glasses. There's even an SBS question addressing this where Oda messes around and says that behind Dovi's glasses is another pair of glasses. But also, uh, at the end of Dress Rosa when Dofi is defeated, his glasses come off and the audience doesn't get to see what's behind them. This quote-unquote mystery has made people wonder if Dofi has special eyes or something. But as far as I can tell, and maybe I'm wrong, Oda gave us the answer to this in this scene and flashback. Unfortunately, it's more clear in the anime. For one, uh, we see one of Dofi's eyes open, and it looks completely normal like any other eye, so there's no showering gone or whatever. The secret seems to be that Dofi only has one eye. He lost his other eye to an arrow shot by the villagers when he was strung up. There are several occasions where Dofi gets blitzed from his blind side, and even the eye we see is the opposite of where his theoretical missing eye would be. But this is just a little detail that I like, which gives the scene extra charm. Another tiny moment that I want to highlight is a certain discussion Dofi has with Law while they're fighting. Dofi tells Law that it's his fault for what's happening in Dresrosa because of his slip up with Virgo. Dofi mocks Law by saying it's his fault that all of the tragedies happened. And Law counters Dofi by saying, so even you consider them tragedies. This gives Dofi pause. Spinning the moral implications of Dofi's actions back on him is interesting because it's not as if Dofi is completely immune to them. He goes on an evil tirade after this and doesn't change and then cuts Law's arm off or whatever. In this moment, you can see a small flash of humanity beneath Dofi. Dofi knows what he's doing is bad, but he chooses to do it anyway. So much bad shit has happened to Dofi that anytime he gets stressed or anything really happens, the only thing he can do is laugh. And that's another thing I want to comment on. As I said before, Laughs are something that One Piece fans like and reference a lot. I brought up in Punk Cast with my statement saying that people liked Caesar more than they should have because of the voice acting. Dofi is another character with an iconic laugh that is made better through voice acting. But unlike in the anime, where certain things just come across better due to the medium, Dofi's laugh still works in the manga because of how it ties into his character. It's not something that relies on another medium to get a message across, which I think is commendable. And everything that we talked about leads up to one of the final points about Dofi's character, and that's one of the roots that authors and most readers love when it comes to villains, which is the ability and justification for empathizing with them. Villains by nature are flawed, 
and those flaws end up being beacons for reader engagement and affection. Once we are given reason to care about a villain, outside of like cool factor type of stuff, it's easier to get us onto their side, so to speak. And beyond everything else that I talked about, this is the number one reason why people like Dofi. Oda does a good job in making the audience understand and feel for how Dofi ended up the way he is. Which doesn't justify anything that he's done, we just understand. Since the characters are so tied together, we might as well just transition over to Law at this point, and then come full circle a little later. Law's flashback is good, easily the most emotional part of this arc. As someone who has a particular weakness to mentoring roles and dynamics, uh, Corazon and Law's relationship usually brings me to tears every single time I read it. I find it to be very powerful. And it basically makes Law's character, although Law is good even without that flashback. People usually like Law prior to Dres Rosa. When the supernova were introduced, Law was near the top of the characters people were most interested in. Which is why Law went from a character that Oda had no plans for to where he is now. After Dres Rosa, however, it's pretty common for Law to be amongst people's most favorite characters in the story. But even among the people who like Law, when looking back on him, especially when looking back on him, you will sometimes come across a sentiment that people have regarding Law's role within Dres Rosa. And that is a sentiment of dissatisfaction on Law's part in Dofi's downfall, a sentiment I agree with. Law's revenge on Dofi does not feel complete. We spend so much time during the arc with Law, learning about him, hearing him say that he wants to be the one to, to end Dofi, this, that, and the other, and Law gets taken out when things start to heat up and get serious. With Dofi using his awakening and Luffy going into gear 4 and then the 1v1. Not only that, but even though Law put in a lot of work in this arc, Ultimately, Law gets kind of shit on. Going from Punk Hazard when Law seemed to OP and was talking about Dofi and how Dofi underestimated him, to Dres Rosa where he's like putting up a fight but getting his ass kicked and arm chopped off, and Dofi putting his nuts in his face and dropping 50 on him is like, damn, okay, maybe Law isn't all that. Which isn't bad per se, but it does become bad since this is a huge, huge issue once we leave Dres Rosa and go into Wano. Being in the community for so long and talking to people about their gripes and whatnot, I've run into a fair amount of people who think that Law should have been the one to defeat Dofi. I do not agree with this. Luffy should always be the trump card against Dofi and a catalyst for launching Law's further interest in Luffy and the D. I think that's correct. Things just could have happened in a different way. What Law needed is better closure with Dofi. Things could have been written differently that gave Law a bigger role in Dofi's defeat, or perhaps it could have been a true 2v1 that comes down to the wire. It would have required Dofi to be stronger as a character, but there's no problem in doing that. With how much the arc is focused on Law, to get the full closure and satisfaction, one last thing between Law and Dofi was mandatory. But that is one of the issues with Dres Rosa. Dres Rosa is not an arc that fully handles the complexity of Dofi's character, and it's a bit of a problem when it comes to the conclusion of Law's Revenge. What do I mean? One of the reasons why people like Dofi, like I said, is because they understand him. A lot of people know that under the same circumstances, they would probably end up the same way as Dofi. Which is why, if you look deeper into Dofi and Law's flashback, it becomes more the case that Corazon, while still a good character, is actually a shit brother and holds some responsibility for what happened with Dofi but the story does not acknowledge it. The story tries to tell you that Dofi is pure evil, he was born that way, he's a monster, and there's nothing that could have d been done that wouldn't have made him evil. But that's not true. Dofi wasn't born evil, he was made evil. He's a product of his environment. He grew up as a celestial dragon, where it was completely normal and accepted for people to have slaves. But even though they had slaves, it's not like Dofi was a monster back then, or up there with his parents. But then his life gets ripped to pieces because his dad is trying to start a rap career in the Grand Line. Dofi has to get food out of trash cans while taking care of his brother who can't fend for himself. Then his mother dies, and people are still coming after him and he gets literally crucified. It's only natural that someone could break under that. And then afterwards, Dofi gets groomed by Trouble and company. Dofi ends up still caring for the people who are important to him, but his anger towards the world is kind of what defines him. Even when Corazon left for six months with Law, Dofi wasn't that strung up about it. 
even when the rest of the family suspected Coruscant was a traitor, Dofi gave him the benefit of the doubt. Dofi is still evil, mind you, but there's a clear difference in how things ended up. Corazon talks about Dofi like he's the devil, but Corazon didn't try to talk to Dofi. It kind of feels like Oda made these characters have depth and then he didn't know what to do about it. A narrative and theme that could have worked to fix all of this is that Corazon failed as a brother with Dofi, he was too late, but then he succeeded with Law. It could have been perfect. Dofi was interested in Law to begin with because he was just like himself. Law was angry at the world, and he needed an outlet for destruction. Dofi wanted to gas that up. But instead of being reinforced in that behavior like Dofi was with trouble, Law found Corazon, and the power of love saved him from becoming a monster. Just like how you could argue that the power of love saved Corazon when Sengoku found him, which is why Corazon, even though he didn't react the same way as Dofi, ended up ultimately being a good boy. Law became good because of his environment, unlike Dofi. This could have been a very powerful theme that led to the final dialogue between Dofi and Law, where that theme was upheld and Dofi is defeated and gets his comeuppance. And also, maybe Law should have actually killed Dofi, which is different than defeating him. Food for thought. Because as it stands, Law wanted to kill Dofi, but Dofi ends up getting jailed instead, which is not a punishment in the One Piece world. To summarize, the dynamic between Dofi and Law is good, it's still good, but the writing behind them is missing a component to it in order to fully utilize their characters and the message behind them. Law's revenge on Dofi feels incomplete without him doing more than just Gamma Knife and acting as a cheerleader for Luffy. It's not as satisfying as it could be. Dofi doesn't understand why Corazon betrayed him, and the element of Dofi's family betraying him from his perspective is also important when talking about the relevance of this theme. At the end of the arc, the conversation between Sengoku and Law provides closure between the characters of Law and Corazon, but you'll notice that Dofi is excluded from the picture entirely, as if he's not a part of it, meaning that the closure for Dofi concerning his relationship with both Corazon and Law, with Law being the big one in this case, feel incomplete. If there had been more between Corazon and Dofi, and Baby 5 had been written differently, these things could have tied nicely into a more memorable defeat for Dofi and the progression for Law pursuing his interest in the D. Pause. The post time skip attempts to do a few new things when compared to the pre time skip, and a lot of that has to do with the villains. In the pre time skip, almost every single villain is mainly just a Mr. McBad guy in the arc that they are involved with. They just need to be beat up, and there is usually not a sympathetic story or emotional aspect to their characters. Some of these villains get more after their defeat, but it's not crucial to their storytelling. That changes with a time skip. Oda tried to make a complex villain with Hody and involve it into the arc's writing, but failed completely. And his next attempt was with Dofi here in Dres Rosa, and he continues to attempt this in future arcs. And while Dofi is not a failure as a villain, he's not a home run either. Dofi fails to be as good as he could be. The conflicting nature of how he is described and viewed within the story by the characters closest to him are what holds him back. That, or it just makes the characters who make conflicting claims about him have horrible observational skills, which I find doubtful. Dofi is also not surrounded by other story elements to overlook these issues. Dofi is like LeBron on the Cavs his first go around. He is surrounded by bad players. Drez Rosa has horrible pacing. Half of his emotional core isn't good. Dofi's sidekick in the arc is Treble, who is one of the most annoying characters in the series. Treble adds nothing positive when paired up with Dofi. It is actually honestly crazy. Treble got as much screen time as he did, and he was the one who groomed Dofi. Treble is so ass, dude. The Tantatas suck, and none of the Grand Fleet's fights are particularly that good. Size fight ruins Baby 5's character, and that's saying something since Baby 5 honestly wasn't that good to begin with. Several straw hats, despite not being emotionally invested into the arc, still manage to get questionable slash bad writing. The birdcage is one of the worst plot device time bombs in, in history. I mean, like, can Dofi get any help here? Like, come on, man. It's just rough when you have a character with such a high ceiling, like Dofi, with so little to work with. When the junk starts to heavily outrank the great stuff, the junk starts to stand out a bit more. Like, there are little nitpicks that just tell you 
yeah, we're not sure what was going on here. Like, Oda might not have had this thing fully figured out when he went to go, you know, manuscript it. Like the Colosseum, which, as an idea, makes no sense. Dofi was holding a tournament in the Colosseum with the Mera Mera as the prize, right? And this attracted fighters from around the world to come and contend. And all of the losers got sent to the junkyard and were turned into slaves. What purpose does that serve for Dofi? Just to be a dick? It's not like he needs more toys or anything for, for to make Dressrosa better as an island. Him turning those people into toys is kind of pointless. And Dofi puts up the prize of the Mera Mera well before Luffy arrived in Punk Hazard. The tournament wasn't designed originally as a trap for Luffy. That's why Sabo, Barton, and all the other people came. The tournament was advertised with that as the prize. Luffy just happened to arrive on Dressrosa the same day as all of the events in Punk Hazard and the tournament was going on to begin with. So it's just a coincidence that it happened to be the perfect bait for Luffy. And uh, as another funny detail, um, Burgess revealed himself in the tournament to everyone. So then Dofi would then know that a Yonko crew member is on his island. But he continued the tournament anyway, even though if anything happened to Burgess, that could potentially lead to a war between Kaido and Blackbeard. Or to have Blackbeard come and just mess up the entire island. And, and another thing, Dofi actually put the Mera Mera in the treasure chest as a legit prize. When I first read Dresrosa, I thought it was going to be a fake since there's no reason to actually uphold that end of the bargain. If the point was to imprison people. But nope, that shit was real the whole time. <laughs> and yeah, I know, I'm going a bit too long on this section. It's just really fun to talk about. It's both a negative and a positive that Dresrosa is not a serious arc, and I'll step in here to clarify what I mean by the phrase, serious arc. In One Piece, a serious arc is when the main characters are engaged with the plot of an arc on more than a surface level interest. Just because civilians are running around crying, and there is theoretically serious stuff going on, doesn't mean that in the broader context of the story, it's a serious arc. There are levels to it. And like I've said a million times, the more serious or important the role of an arc is, the criteria for those arcs change because it's something that's really important. And if it gets messed up, it damages and impacts the quality of the story more than random stuff. But because Dresrosa isn't serious, it's easier to point out and look at all of its flaws. And its heavy flaws make its length completely unjustifiable. I still think Dresrosa is the best post time skip arc. But that doesn't mean this arc is good, because it's not a good arc. The good that exists in this arc is simply more than the previous arcs of Punk Harrison and Fishman Island, and the bigger arcs past Dresrosa manage to be worse than it. Which leads me to talk about an arc that may seem odd to talk about in a critical light because it's almost universally beloved, and is in many people's top arcs, specifically their favorite arc of the post-time skip, Zo. This will probably be the most controversial thing within this video and potentially within the entire video series of the downfall of One Piece. I used to like Zo quite a bit, and for a while I thought Zo was the best post time skip arc in isolation. Zo is a smooth and coherent experience. It's the first arc in the post time skip that is not short. 23 chapters compared to everything else we've seen so far is a breath of fresh air. And that's exactly what Zo was. Mystery, exploration, lore, plot twists, drama, blackback. Zo's got them all, baby. It's the part of the post time skip where the end game goal starts to come into view. Road poneglyphs are introduced, the keys to Raftal Man, the thing that determines who will be the Pirate King, the beginning of the Yonko saga. What could possibly be wrong with any of this? In isolation, not much. There are a few things I could point to that are more like preference and taste, such as, I never really liked the rise of a safe moment all that much. At that point, I hadn't really developed any emotional connections to the Minx, so their struggle didn't move me. When we did find Raizo, I didn't care for him, I thought his design was whack, and it made me want to ignore him. But like I said, that's all taste. I didn't have any issues with it from a writing perspective. It was clever. I was interested, just not invested. I thought a lot of things worked really well for what Zoe was trying to accomplish, in isolation. The idea of Zoe was fantastic, and wasn't something I ever expected Oda to do. And this was back when I was one of his angels, too. Now you'll notice I keep saying, in isolation. 
If I ignore the context of the rest of the story, Zoe is great. But Zoe, more so than any single arc in One Piece, is a setup arc. As a matter of fact, it sets up two arcs at the same time. And that's where my issues with Zoe come into play. Zoe's numerous plot lines and characters are all inherently tied to the arcs they are setting up. The payoff for everything is linked to something else. Almost every single subplot and all of the setup built from Zoe either amounts to nothing, is contradicted by future plot lines or information, or is left incomplete. One of the only exciting things that isn't ruined is the lore from the Poneglyphs. They, so far, haven't been botched in Whole Cake Island or Wano. Because this arc is a setup arc, I can't ignore the context surrounding it. Zoe is only as strong as what amounts from it. If everything linked to it turns to shit, then I am no longer able to look at Zoe and cherish all of its golden moments. I will go into detail on these things later, as we cover when they're ruined in the arcs. Talking about them in depth here will make future points redundant and require you to remember everything I said here, unless I repeat myself. Instead, I'll do a rundown of all of the things Whole Kick Island and Wano Sully from Zoe. The main antagonist of Zoe, Jack, Nekomushi and Inuarashi, Odin, Momonosuke, Brook's Forgotten Subplot, Sanji, Zoro, Frankie, the traitor of Zoe. That is a long list of things for a short arc, and most of them are pretty important. Almost everything that was once good about Zoe is tainted to me. If Zoe had a metaphorical ring, it would be made out of cubic zirconia. People who adore Hokuk Island and Wano will obviously disagree with everything I just said here. You'll come to understand my perspective in time, but for now, I ask for your patience just like you give Goda. That brings us to the end of part two. Sorry it took so long to get here. By the time you are watching this, I should already be working on part three, where we are going to talk about Hokuk Island, the second worst arc in all of One Piece. Thanks to those who helped me with this video and script. I brought in more help compared to the last time to get more eyes on this so I can avoid things I hadn't seen in part one. Shoutouts to Glam, Christian, Sen, Stebo, Jake, and Quietly. And thank you all for watching. And until next time, see ya. Children, have you ever met the bogeyman before? No, of course you haven't, for you're much too good, I'm sure. Don't you be afraid of him if he should visit you. He's a great big coward, so I'll tell you what to do. Hush, 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 here comes the bogeyman. Don't let him come too close to you, he'll catch you with...